London. Um, nobody knows, I think, is a good answer. There is obviously a lack of certainty politically, um, and there's a huge lack of certainty about, about Brexit. Um, Theresa May's loss of her majority in the election has clearly undermined her own control of her position. Um, and it's made her government much more open than it was. Um, it's raised the profile of the Treasury and the Chancellor, um, who might well have been sacked had you won a big majority. Um, but it's, it's then led to a situation where you have cabinet ministers unusually in Britain openly contradicting each other, which we saw recently with Hammond and Davis. So there are, there are arguments going on within the cabinet um, over many things public sector pay gap, but also they want to do about Brexit. And meanwhile, the opposition, um, which did better than expected in the election, is still studiously, to me, in my mind, vague of what it really thinks should happen in Britain and the European Union. Um, uh, whoever thought that what we should do is have a referendum to settle the question of the EU once and for all, I think we can say that they have not just that did not happen. Um, but perhaps, perhaps the most critical new development in recent weeks, I think, has been that business has started to speak up much more about the future of the country, and particularly about Brexit. Um, even the city is beginning to press its case more openly than it did before, despite a perception which I, I share that the city is not the most popular part of the country, and indeed one of the reasons people voted for Brexit was a dislike of the city end of London. But it's not just financial services, it's other businesses, the pharmaceutical industry, the car industry, universities, what is sometimes called the flat white economy. They're all beginning to talk up about the fear that too hard a Brexit could be seriously damaging. And I think that is going to play a role in the next, in the next few months. Um, one interesting fact to me about these developments is that quite a lot of them, and I cite particularly the example of what we like to call a jargonistic of the flat white economy, are focusing not so much as you might have expected on whether Britain should stay in or out of the single market, but on the question of migration. And the message they are putting across firmly is that too rigid and tough a system of immigration control would be very damaging, not just to London, but to the whole British economy as well as to the public sector. So I, I detect the beginnings of a backlash against the notion that the referendum was all about immigration control and that we have to deliver much less immigration from the EU in order to satisfy the voters. And I think that's an interesting one to watch. Um, and a consequence of all these developments is that I think some of the options that seem to have been taken off the table may now be, be getting back on the table. I don't think that includes what some people in Brussels and elsewhere would like, which is to revert to membership of the European Union. But I think it does include looking again at the question of whether a, a, a relationship based around a customer union with the European Union might be worth examining, and even possibly some form of remaining in, in the single market. None of these will be easy, they never were, and that's one reason why the debate has been so difficult in Britain. Um, the truth about almost all of these alternative options is that they're worse for Remainers, who would prefer to stay in the European Union as full members, and they're also worse for Leavers, who prefer to have more control and to escape from the European Court of Justice. But I think even so, some of these options are, are back, on, back on the table. And then I would just say one more positive development post-election, if you like, is that it's clearly going to give a bigger role to MPs and to Parliament. Um, uh, as Britain has experienced previously, when you have a minority government, even one of the 40s, a rather dodgy link with certain people across the border, um, getting legislation through is much harder than it was for the majority government. And in the case of Brexit in particular, there is a massive amount of legislation that does need to be got through, not just the repeal bill, but a lot of associated legislation to put in place new, um, new, new arrangements for a post-Brexit Britain. Getting all that through both houses is going to be very challenging, and I think that is encouraging in some ways because it does mean that MPs ought to have a greater say in precisely what happens, um, and that could have unpredictable results. So that's, that's what I wanted to say about what is going on in London. What's going on in Brussels? Well, the first thing to say is that um, both in Brussels and in places like Dublin, 
some of the papers that have been produced on the consequences of Brexit and how to deal with it are far more impressive, far more detailed, and far more interesting than anything coming out of London. And I think that reflects the fact that London still doesn't really know quite what it wants from this negotiation, but the rest of the European Union sees it as, if you like, an enlargement negotiation in reverse, and they know how to handle <coughs> enlargement negotiations, and they're producing all the papers and documents and so on. Um, they are taking, I think the rest of the European Union is taking a very maximalist position in almost every area that it has discussed so far, and I don't just mean the budget, I also refer to EU citizens and so on, which is not a surprise, because this is, this is supposed to be a negotiation, um, but it has caused some surprise and shock in London. Um, and I think there is a certain frustration in Brussels that although they have had many detailed discussions with officials in both London and Brussels from the British government, ministers in the British government don't always seem to have been well enough briefed or at least don't seem to have listened to the briefs that they have been given. Um, that reinforces a common view I find in Brussels that they are surprised that no preparations at all appear to have been made before the 23rd of June for what would happen if the referendum produced what the British government then thought would be the wrong result. And of course they are especially irked, the rest of Europe in my view, by the continuation of what they like to call the having cake and eat it syndrome. Um, uh, in effect, the message that comes out to me uh, for the rest of the European Union is there are a number of different relationships a country like Britain could have with the European Union. You might call them four or five different menu feeks um, but they are not, that, that does not mean that you can have an a la carte relationship where you take one bit from one menu and add a bit from another menu. Um, and I think they still feel that there are people in London, including ministers, who would like to do an a la carte relationship. And the, uh, there are so many obvious examples of that, the full benefits of the single market without free movement of labour, some EEA type deal like Norway without any role for the European Court of Justice. I think the feeling in Brussels, correctly in my view, is that ministers in London have not really absorbed the notion, or maybe they are beginning to now, that there are trade-offs here and you can't actually get the best of both worlds. Um, the process is working, the working group is meeting, um, papers are being published. One of the other features of this negotiation is that everything is being done in public. Uh, I think that was predictable, partly because almost everything in Brussels is done in public, but it's also because the European Parliament feels it has to be involved, and if that happens, then clearly the Commission, the Council, need to publish everything that they're doing. So the idea that you can have a negotiation conducted behind closed doors and then present a package at the end of it, which some people in London seem to believe was never, was never going to be on. I think it is also clear who has the greater bargaining power in this negotiation. As I'm sure many of you know, David Davis announced in the summer that there would be a massive row about sequencing in this negotiation. But as soon as the negotiation began, he had to accept the sequencing that the European Commission proposed. And I think the British will have to accept the interpretation of the rest of Europe about what is meant by the word sufficient progress. That doesn't mean there is not scope for some very big battles, particularly over issues like the budget, um, which is a traditional battleground for the British government, indeed the first time I've worked on European matters, uh, or came, came across European matters, was when we were having um, arguments about what was then called the European Community Budget. So that is um, an area in which Britain, if you like, has previous. Um, and I think there is, therefore, a risk, I don't put it very high, but there is a risk that negotiations could have a complete breakdown at some point. Um, the, the notion that has sometimes come out of London that no deal is better than a bad deal is not one that we are hearing today as much as we did three months ago, but it hasn't gone away completely. There is a constituency inside the Conservative Party that still thinks that the best thing to do would be simply to walk out of the room. Um, and I don't think, um, I, I mean, that is a, dis a very undesirable outcome for everybody, but I wouldn't say that it's completely gone away. And perhaps the two things that um, everybody can agree on in these negotiations now, July 2017, are, number one, that there isn't enough time. Um, everybody can agree, including people in London who didn't always see this, that the idea of negotiating a complete Article 50 deal and a new trade relationship by about October or November of next year is completely untenable. Um, uh, and I think
think it is also widely accepted that it would be difficult in a formal way just simply to extend the Article 50 deadline. It can be done, it's not out of the question, but it's one, as everybody knows, that requires unanimous approval of the entire European Council. And I think it's never been likely, because as soon as you start extending a deadline like that, you weaken the EU27's bargaining position against the UK. Um, if you can always extend a deadline, then it's quite difficult to make the deadline mean anything. Something that I think we are seeing north of the border right at this moment in relation to the power sharing executive. And hence, second point, quite early on this autumn, I think people will begin to focus quite a lot of attention on precisely what should happen on March 29th, 2019. And the answer that they will light upon is some kind of transitional period. Um, we don't know quite what that will be, and it's not as simple as it sounds, but, uh, but I, and I think it's politically challenging in a way for both sides. Uh, and it's hard to agree on a transitional period if you have no idea about what end point you're reaching. You don't know whether it's a bridge or a phasing out. But I think it will still come into the negotiation. And it seems to me obvious that the most plausible transition period is simply a prolongation of the status quo in one form or another. And it is already clear from the way it is being discussed in London that that would be acceptable even to those who are most enthusiastic about Brexit, so long as they believe it is not something like the European Economic Area, which people tell me was set up as a transitional arrangement. They don't, it will not be acceptable if it is thought of as something that could last for 20 or 30 years. But if it lasts for three, four, or five years, I think it could be acceptable. And clearly, it's better than falling off a cliff edge. Um, my third point, more briefly, is just a few thoughts from the other side of the Irish Sea on what is sometimes called the Irish question. Um, uh, as I'm sure you all know in this room, um, regrettably, despite the efforts of some of us writing on this subject, this issue was completely ignored during the referendum campaign. There was a little bit of a focus on what you could call the Scottish question, uh, in my view, wrongly, because I never thought the referendum even if it went the way it did, would immediately lead to independence for Scotland. And indeed, the prospect of an independent Scotland has actually receded, not increased. But it was obvious to anybody who looked at the subject that um, a decision to leave the European <coughs> Union would have implications for this island. Um, I think one of the reasons it was difficult to debate this uh, before the referendum was that both the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland and the First Minister were very enthusiastic leavers, a position that I found really rather astonishing given the implications for Northern Ireland, but that's politics. Um, where we've got to since, number one, I would say congratulations to the Irish government uh, for making clear that this agenda is, this, this, this issue is a very important one. Um, number two, therefore, congratulations again for putting the issue of the border right on the table at the beginning of the negotiations. Um, I also think that the Irish government has been very good at, um, at, at supporting the notion that um, both the Good Friday Agreement and the peace process in Northern Ireland in general have been something that has been very important to the whole European Union, something that I think Michel Barnier personally, as, as then regional commissioner, also believes um, Northern Ireland uh, over the last 20 years has been a success for the European Union, not just for Dublin and London. And I think that's why the other countries also have a huge stake in making sure that that remains true. Yet it is obvious that Brexit is the biggest blow to this island in 20 years. Um, Ireland will clearly take a hit from it, almost in whatever form it takes place. Um, I think the concern that it might interfere with the common travel area, which some people still worry about, is less important than the much more significant concern about trade across the border and customs, which is very much on the table. And it seems to me this is another have your cake and eat it area. Everybody agrees that there should be a frictionless border, but this is going to be a border not between Britain and the Republic of Ireland, but between Britain and the European Union. And a frictionless border, if one country is in a customs union and one country is not, is not an easy thing to envisage. Is there an answer? Um, I'd like to hope that somebody in this audience would know that there is an answer. Um, there are people in London who sometimes say, oh, we can deal with this with technical solutions. 
Um, I'm rather skeptical about whether that is enough. Um, and then, of course, the latest suggestion out of, out of London, actually out of an Irish diplomat, I believe, is that we can solve this problem because Ireland should follow Brexit, follow Britain out of the European Union. I think um, one prediction I can make is that that is highly unlikely to happen. Um, uh, the notion that England, having forced Scotland and Northern Ireland against their wills out of the European Union, could now do the same to the Republic of Ireland, I think is a bit far-fetched. Uh, and I actually believe, as an outside observer, that a more likely scenario in the long run is actually a united Ireland. Um, I'm not sure how enthusiastic people on either side of the border are for that, but I do think it's a possibility that people should start thinking about and then a few minutes, Dan, on the future of the European Union, which is sometimes forgotten in this discussion. Um, I happen to think that however much you may feel Britain has been a pain in the neck in Europe, it has been an important member of the European Union. And I think, therefore, Brexit is bad, not just for Britain, but for the European Union. Um, uh, losing the liberal voice of Britain weakens the European Union, and clearly Brexit is very bad for the European Union in foreign security and defence policy. Uh, and to me, that points to a conclusion that has not been sufficiently emphasised uh, in recent discussion. It is very important for both Britain and the European Union uh, 27 to keep Britain involved in all of these areas. And finding a way of doing it is not as straightforward as some people think. Once again, in some areas, it raises the question of the European Court of Justice. But I think um, some way of involving Britain is very important. Um, second thing about the future of the EU and where it is now is that the condition of the European economies is particularly interesting at the moment, as I'm sure many of you have seen in the last two weeks. Uh, Britain has moved from being the fastest growing large member of the European Union to, in the first quarter, the slowest growing member of the entire European Union. Um, I think that is interesting. Um, it's interesting psychologically because one of the driving motives for Brexit was always the notion that somehow the European Union was a corpse and we were shackled to this corpse and we needed to cut the shackles in order to, in order to sail away on, on, a global, uh, on a global front. If we are now moving into a position which I think is quite likely that actually the European Union and the Eurozone will work, uh, will, will grow faster than the UK, I think that could have a psychological effect on the Brexit negotiations themselves. Having said that, I do worry a bit that some people are saying that the Eurozone's problems are <coughs> completely, completely over, everything is hunky-dory, all we need to do is sit back and let Mr Macron work his magic and Europe will... Will, will thrive and there is no need for further change. And I still think that the Eurozone does need further reform. Banking union is incomplete. There, is, there are still complete differences of view between France and Germany on how to run the Eurozone. Um, when the next crisis hits, it could hit any country at all, including, for example, Italy. So I think that um, the Euro is not completely out of the woods. And then, of course, the European Union still has many other problems that have not been resolved. What to do about refugees, how to cope with Russia, what to do about relations with the United States. So I, I, I'm hopeful that just because things look better at the moment, people in Brussels and in national capitals do not um, lapse back into a complacent feeling that post-Brexit everything is wonderful, because I think actually Brexit did send a signal about the dissatisfaction of ordinary voters with the European project. Um, and you can look at other countries inside the European Union, including places like Poland and Hungary, to see where, where things need to change. And I also would like my concluding comment to hope that one consequence of all these discussions might be a re-examination of the architecture of Europe. Uh, I'm not saying that the European Union should be done away with, clearly it shouldn't be. But I do think that there are issues about the future of Europe that are worth re-examining. Um, uh, there are many countries in Europe that are not in the U European Union. There are many countries in the European Union that are not in the Euro. Um, some kind of solution based around a multi-speed, multi-tier groupings would be a good way of resolving some of the issues in Europe, including the Western Balkans, Ukraine, Turkey, and possibly even Britain. And I think that something like that would be worth examining, uh, in which some countries participate in certain activities in the European Union and, and others not. Uh, a better and more imaginative approach to Europe could help all of us.